Let's do this video. This is, once again, How Being a Cop Broke My Brain by That Dang Dad, who is somebody I've never heard of before. Uh, so this is my first time watching their videos, let alone this video. Let's do it together! Okay, I'll do that. I'll put that on the list, Ixtrums. Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight I want to return to a topic I haven't done a video on in a while, law enforcement. If you're new to the channel, you should know that I used to be a police officer in a pretty rowdy part of California. In the years since then, though, I've become a police and prison abolitionist, meaning I believe that the entire concept of police forces and prisons is not reformable and it must be replaced with something that's True! more compassionate, more just, more committed to dignity and meeting human needs. I'll put a link in the description below if you want to see me do a deeper dive on that topic. Tonight though, I want to set aside the academic texts and the philosophy and all that nerd shit, and I want to get personal about how my time in law enforcement really fucked my brain up. Tonight we're going to be talking about state violence and some of the nasty stuff that cops see in the line of duty, so if you're not in the mood for blood and guts and man's inhumanity to man, you might want to skip this one tonight. All right, everybody. Anyway, it's there's be nothing cops love more than captivating then. an audience with a war story, so I'll start with one of mine. So there I was, Saturday night, M4 rifle in hand, monitoring the perimeter of a housing complex in the middle of a neighborhood. Our gang unit had been tracking an armed and dangerous gangster wanted for murder, and they'd seen him enter the middle property of a triplex where his family was hiding him. We quietly evacuated the two end properties. We prepared to make a uh, dynamic entry, as they say. You know, this is the police, come out with your hands up, no answer, and go the flashbangs, and go the tear gas. After a moment, the gang unit radioed that the gangster had climbed up into the attic of the triplex, which was accessible to the two end units. I was tasked with standing in the doorway of the south unit in case he tried to sneak out that way. I was reminded that he was armed, dangerous, and had already killed. So there I stood as the gang unit began to throw more and more tear gas up into the attic, waiting to see if this guy was going to drop down right in front of me. And I did what I'd been trained to do. I visualized shooting him in the chest until he stopped moving. Over and over and over and over again. I pictured him crashing through the ceiling. I pictured him sneaking around a corner. I pictured him running at me. I pictured him shooting at me. I pictured him wounding me. And every time, I pictured firing until the threat had been eliminated. I have no idea how many times I annihilated this guy in my mind palace. 40, 50 times. And it's not because I hated this guy or really wanted to score my first kill on the job, it was because I wasn't quite sure I could actually do it. I was taking a page out of Dave Grossman's training and I was psyching myself up and convincing myself that yes, I could kill someone if I had to. After all, he was armed, he was dangerous, and he'd already killed before. So what options did awesome, I have? Ashmore, thank you. Ultimately, blinded and choking on tear gas, he fell through the roof of the middle unit directly in front of our canine unit. Did you know dogs are not incapacitated by tear gas? The gangster and I both learned this right about the same time, and it was it was a bad night for him. After all that, I put my gear back in my cop car, took a quick drink of water, and resumed my shift. Off to go break up loud parties, referee marital disputes, and chase away teens on a would-be beer run. All that violent energy I'd been working with, all that visualization of hurting and killing people. Gone. On to the next call. I tell you this story because it's emblematic of much of my law enforcement career. When I first started out, I was criticized for being meek, timid, too slow to show dominance out in the field. I was taught that showing that kind of weakness on calls would make me a target for attack. I was shown hundreds of videos of cops being killed on routine calls for service. By the way, what he's talking about here is something that we've discussed on the channel a couple of times, which is the, uh, the warrior mindset. It's a it's a type of training that American cops that's extreme and I mean extremely popular among American cops and uh, it has been it ha many 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 critics have come out to say that this is this training contributes to the amount of uh, police de uh, police killings in the United States. For those who don't know, police kill a lot of people in the United States more than basically any other country. The police in America shoot and choke and kill a lot of people. We have 
a brutal police force. And most people don't think about that when they think of America. But that's mostly because it's Americans who are dying to the police force, and specifically it's marginalized Americans. People of color, queer people of color. He has a, he has a video about going through that. Maybe we'll watch that. It was literally called Killology, yeah. The warrior mindset is a huge part of why the thin blue line even happened. Yeah, the thin blue line is an idea that the police are the only thing separating the white stripe, the good people, interestingly, a lot, of, a lot of racial psychology going on there, separating the white stripe from the black stripe, the barbarous hordes of, the, the, of criminals that crawl our society. It is a demented and explicitly fascistic mentality and if you're, I, I, if you go out frequently, you have probably seen more and more and more thin blue line flags, often uh, displayed alongside or even merged with the Punisher symbol. The Punisher being the vigilante anti-hero who tortures and kills criminals above the law. Uh, that is extremely popular in America right now. I know basically every time I go out, there is a good chance that I will see at least one car featuring a Punisher thin blue line flag in my area. Anyway, let's continue. By assailants who didn't really look like killers. At the same time, on my days off, I was training in Krav Maga alongside many other cops and military veterans. Krav is extremely aggressive and it very often touches on mindset. We trained on how to fight a carjacker inside your own car. We trained on last ditch techniques to disarm somebody who was trying to shoot you execution style. One night the instructor made us fight cradling a baby doll in our arms to simulate our own child. The point was that you never knew what kind of awful situation might be coming your way. Do you see how essential fear a putting people into a perpetual state of fear, putting people into a mindset of fear is absolutely vital to getting them to be able to do violent things. Humans struggle with violence. It is traumatic to us. And pretty much the only way to guarantee that you can do violence at a moment's notice is to ritualistically traumatize yourself so that you do not feel anything when you are confronted with violence, especially, and that's especially important, if that violence has to be done to people who you would otherwise consider your countrymen, your neighbors. Also, interestingly, this is, a, this is one of the reasons why uh, police officers uh, often serve in communities they do not live in, in America specifically. It is very common for police officers to be assigned to a different district than the one that they live in because they will there they will be less likely to be empathetic towards people who aren't their literal neighbors. Isn't that interesting? All right, Octavia. Put that on the list. Thank you, Octavia. Let's continue. So over time, I internalized this message. At any given time, someone out there is going to hurt you if you're not ready to hurt them first. If you let your guard down for even a second, they'll kill you. In the police business, this is how we talk about officer safety. The most respected veteran officers that I worked with were the ones that were pulling young guys back from running around blind corners. They were the ones saying, hey, did you search that dumpster before we turn our back on it? You got the sense that they had seen things and that they knew how to keep themselves safe. And you got the sense that the big thing you can do to protect yourself on the job is to mentally prepare for that day. And since you never knew what form the attack would take, it's best to just run scenarios in your head constantly building those mental pathways so that when it finally does happen, you'll know exactly what to do. So that Hello, Finger. Uh, thanks for being in chat. Uh, uh, thanks for being here. And, and hello to you in Australia. Here's a good follow-up vid. All right. Oh, this is a video about specifically about police training. All right. We'll watch this one afterwards then. I'll put this one next on the list. It would be thematically great. All right. Let's continue. That's what I trained my brain to do on duty. I drove around and I... 
Welsh Heron brings up a great uh, a great point. The shared trauma also serves to strengthen the bond between other police officers, self-perpetuating the culture. Same thing happens in the military. Yes, it is a it is uh uh it is uh manually uh, the whole idea is that you're manually forming an emotional, a deep emotional us versus them. Not just a surface us versus them, which obviously anytime you're conflicting with somebody, it is us versus them. But I'm talking about a deep emotional attachment to the idea of the us, the 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 familiar, the the local, the 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 the, the good guys, and the other, the bad guys, the strange, the foreign. Continue. Imagined. Gotcha, Morgan. What if a guy with Thank a gun you. popped out of the trunk of that car over there and started shooting at me? Uh, what if I saw a man with a knife running down that alley? What would I do if a Sorry. plane there crashed into Got City it. Hall? Got over it. time, my brain began to do this off-duty as well. I wouldn't sit in restaurants with my back to the front door so that I could monitor everybody coming in. I walked through mall parking lots with my head on a swivel. I stared down people who looked out of place just so they'd known that I'd Oh, welcome Siberian Winter. First time he Siberian Winter says, my first time here, been watching clips on YouTube. Nice to finally make it out to a stream and to finally meet you all. Well, welcome, welcome Siberian Winter. We're happy to have you. Uh, I'm glad everybody's, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad you felt uh, uh, well, welcome enough to come by a live stream. Sorry, we're we're doing so much heavy stuff tonight, but I guess that's how it goes when you cover politics. Uh, let's listen to this part again. This is this is the hyper vigilance. Front door, so that I could monitor everybody coming in. I walked through mall parking lots with my head on a swivel. I stared down people who looked out of place, just so they'd known that I'd seen them. I was constantly in a state of vigilance, not concern, just vigilance. My Krav instructor used the color code system to talk about emotional states, you know, white, yellow, orange, red, black. And he used to say that you should never leave the house without being at at least code yellow. That you should. That is, that is so unhealthy. <sighs> that is so unhealthy. Marinara, have a wonderful night. You should always be at all times situationally aware when you are not in your own house. Just just try to understand the type of mentality, the type of world that you have to live in where you think it's okay to, to any time you leave your house to walk into your neighborhood. What type of society justifies being a, at a yellow alertness, at a situationally aware level just for walking out of your house? It sounds like a very tiring way to live. It's not just tiring. It breaks your brain. It breaks your brain. Part of the issue is that they teach paranoia instead of actual situational awareness. Well, that's what saying that you should always be at yellow, at a yellow alertness level anytime you leave your house is how you guarantee that people only develop paranoia and don't become situationally aware. Situational awareness is like hey, I am near a, a busy road. I should be able to acknowledge that there is some types of danger that exist near a busy road and I shouldn't cross the road without walking. The, situationally aware is not every time I walk out of my house, I'm prepared that somebody might try to kill me. Dusty Rat says, I have PTSD and agoraphobia and feeling hypervigilance at all times is fucking hell. Yeah. I feel like this is when I, this when I leave my house, but again, I'm not a cop. I'm just mentally ill. Yeah, it's not a healthy way to live. And these the in cops, they're they're cultivating it. They are cultivating that paranoia. To what end? Well, lethality, so that you're ready to kill. All right, Amphi, I'll take a look at that. That sounds interesting. Thank you, Ampy. Let's continue. Should never be totally relaxed in public. And I never was. And to this day, I never am. 
It's been a long time since my cop days now, but this hypervigilance has never left me. And what at one time felt like a survival tool I was proud of, now just makes me exhausted and probably exhausting to be around. I hate leaving my house. I don't like going out and doing things with lots of people. If it's too loud and crowded somewhere, I don't feel like I'm in control. I don't feel safe. Sometimes I dissociate a little bit just as a treat. But even worse than the hypervigilance, the thing I can't turn off is my imagination. Not only did law enforcement train me to imagine a thousand different horrible events, law enforcement involved my participation in a thousand different horrible events. I've seen bodies riddled with bullets. I've seen stabbing victims crawling through their own blood. I've seen car accidents render the driver unrecognizable. And I've seen children horrifically abused and even killed. So even now, long after my cop days, my brain will conjure up unbidden a, uh, hey, what if this happened? Uh, hey, what if a home invader breaks in and takes you hostage? What if your partner drives off a bridge? What if there's a mass shooting at this theater? All kinds of stuff. And for a while, I could tell myself I was just being prepared. Mass shootings happen all the time in the United States. Why shouldn't I mentally prepare? I wrote this line after the Buffalo shooting and before the Uvalde shooting. It wasn't until my daughter was born that I started to realize that maybe actually what I was doing wasn't normal. All new parents experience the fears and the what ifs, but I spent the first year and a half of my daughter's life in an almost daily battle with my own mind. It was a constant onslaught of the most horrible what if scenarios. You Aria B T B T L G S Aria Belt Bit Bitligs Aria Bitligs. Welcome to chat. Thank you for being here. Bruh, I have diagnosed paranoia and I live like this all the time. It sucks. This type of hyper-awareness leads to mild hallucinations really easily. How can you work as a cop in this kind of mental state? The cops want their guys in that state. The cops currently in America are, are constantly saying that there is a war against criminals. Even though crime, violent crime, is way lower than it has been uh, through almost every point in American history. I think it's literally like the lowest it's ever been in American history. Besides maybe there might've been like a year or two in the nineties that was lower. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. That's why they kill so much. They're trained that way on purpose. They exist to kill poor and marginalized people and to be violent to protest. They, the cops are used all the time to crack down on peaceful protest. They get in the situation and they interpret innocuous signals as violence. And then, then a cop riot happens, like what happened uh, in the summer of 2020. This is why cops feel like an occupying force. It's also, look, I could tell you guys about my memories from the BLM protests. In my city, there were tanks and security checkpoint checkpoints. When I say tanks, I mean like APCs, armored personnel carriers. I mean, to go to a restaurant in my city meant driving past a bunch of soldiers and an APC parked on a on a on a corner, looking you in the eyes as if you are going to be committing a crime. It's. It is. It is. It, it's about creating the sense. Uh, it's. It's about. It's about oppression. It's about repression. Unironically, it's about creating an environment in which people are too afraid to even come close to the line. The line that keeps moving even closer. The things that are defined as violence. Oh, you raised your voice. You're a danger. Hildroy says, this kind of training really does break your brain. I've watched people who are extremely put together tell me they can't even trust their spouse anymore because they were taught not to, not to trust anyone. Uh, Rumi Red says, didn't they also create a curfew that went into effect uh, in five minutes and use that to gas all the protesters? That happened multiple times in Seattle. But yes, the first and most and arguably most terrible night of the protests involved a massive crowd getting uh, the, the I can I can tell you it. I can tell you the story. There was a massive crowd in Capitol Hill, peaceful protesters uh, with umbrellas and whatnot. There was there was there was no uh, uh, there was no bricks thrown. There was no gunfire, um, and the cops received. Uh, they petitioned a judge, 
and they got a curfew order, which was which was timed for 8 p.m. And they put it into effect at 7.55 p.m. So they got an order. The place must be vacated by 8 p.m. or else you are in violation of a court order. And there was, of course, a crowd of thousands of people. There is literally no physical way that you could ever disperse a crowd of a thousand of thousands of people in five minutes. So even the people who were trying to leave when that five minutes passed were violating curfew. Therefore, they became criminals because you were in violation of curfew. And the cops charged the audience and or the char the cops charged the um, protesters. And if you go and you watch the footage, you can watch the moment when that happened. There are archives all across the web of the moment that the Seattle protests got attacked by the cops. And it was a charge. The cops shot tear gas. They hit people with tear gas cans. They, they hit people with batons. They hit them with uh, electrified shields. They tased them. There are videos of the cops smashing their bikes down on the heads of protesters. It was a cop riot, and it was done via technicality. Via a technicality that no peaceful person could have ever lived up to and couldn't. A bunch of peaceful protesters got their heads bashed in, got their eyes damaged, an entire section of town permanently trauma traumatized because the cops wanted to crack skulls. For those of you who do not know this, which is probably a lot of you, uh, back in 2020, it was the first year that I was streaming. Um, hold on. The first George Floyd protest occurred on May of May 26 of 2020. When I, I was a small streamer, and I uh, was doing coverage of the protests. So what I would do is I would boot up my stream and uh, I would watch footage and I would discuss it as it happened. We would hop between streams and we would watch it happen. And then I would get off stream and I would continue watching these streams. I would continue listening to the radio scanner and uh, I actually, I, I actually had a complete uh, burnout. By, by the middle of June, I was having constant panic attacks because I had been watching uh, people in my town get their heads cracked. My area of town had been placed under an unjust, arguably illegal curfew. Not kidding you. There was no protest in my area of town, but we were not allowed for a number for multiple days we were not allowed to go out past eight o'clock if you were out on this if you were out driving your car past eight o'clock cops would stop you and interrogate you when we would go into town if we needed to, if we wanted to go get food at a restaurant if we wanted to go visit my friend there were military vehicles national guard vehicles and cops all over the place every corner had a bundle of armed cops with weapons it was a war zone our neighborhood got repeatedly buzzed by a military helicopter for no reason. The, the helicopter came down past our neighborhood multiple times. I lived in a I lived in a poor district of town at this time, much poorer. Uh, I I don't live very far from there now, but I moved over a neighborhood, and you know how that goes. Uh, and they were it was enough that it was shaking the walls of the entire tenement building. I'm not kidding you. They were buzzing the neighborhoods just to make sure that there was a state of fear so that people wouldn't go and join the protests that were happening in Seattle City. Fuck people who works past 8 p.m. If you if you can uh, if you say, if you were going to work, the cops would let you go. Uh, a curfew doesn't affect people who are going to work. You just have to have a, a like a plausible reason. But if you go, like, I'm going to the store, they'll be like, go back home. Do you think American cops are uniquely insane compared to other countries? Uh, yes and no. I think at this point in history, American cops are pretty uniquely insane. But historically, police have always been like this. Uh, 
police are uh, are a violent institution that is designed to inspire fear and specifically inspire fear mostly on behalf of um, private of private property uh, and almost nothing else. Uh, that is the reason why there are tons of cops hanging out in the parking lots of Walmarts all the time. That is why cops are dispersed to protect businesses first. That is why cops uh, do not charge businesses to protect them uh, generally. Um, yeah, that's 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 the basic rundown. Anyway, let's con let's finish this video. Let's finish this video. You can possibly imagine so bad i won't even describe them to you every night i had to fight my brain to go to sleep breathing exercises meditations rain sounds sleep stories melatonin cbd anything that would just shut the projector off it's a minor miracle i didn't end up abusing alcohol very much during that time because some nights a nice big glass of scotch was a really easy way to tell my brain to just shut the fuck up I was looking into therapy at one point and then COVID hit and between that and budget stuff, I basically just gave up on that idea for the time being. After some research, I ended up buying a self-guided CBT workbook, not that kind, the other kind, and doing exercises in that for a while. And believe it or not, that actually kind of helped. I don't know if it was just feeling like I had some kind of outlet to work on this stuff or whether I just got less anxious over time as my daughter stayed healthy and happy, but I'm in a much better place than I was two years ago. I'll even give you one of my tricks in case you need it. When I catch my thoughts start to race down a bad path and I realize that I'm rehearsing for tragedy, I'll say to myself out loud, you don't need to rehearse right now. If this ever happens, you'll know what to do. And if the thought is really atrocious, sometimes I will say to myself out loud, this is a stupid fucking thing to obsess over. We're going to think about a different topic right now. The thing about saying it out loud just makes for nice thought pattern reboot. I don't know why. This is called self-talk. As it turns out, uh, your brain is pretty good at determining the difference between other people telling you something and yourself telling you things, but not perfect, actually. So self-talk actually does work. And it's almost as if somebody else told you that. Obviously, your brain is not going to completely interpret your own words as that. But saying them out loud put... Uh, makes it make like it's self-talk is, a, is a, a literally studied psychological tool and you should use it. It's not cringe actually to help yourself calm down. It works for catastrophizing. Yes. There's all kinds of things. Obviously it doesn't fix everything, but it's a very good, uh, 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 tactic. Yeah. Why it works for me, but it does. So why am I telling you all this? Is it to generate sympathy for cops? Absolutely not. A cab forever. Is it to dissuade young people from going into law enforcement? No, but I'll take it. I think the reason that I wanted to talk about this tonight was as a way of explaining why so many cops behave the way that they do and why they seem to feel a sense of entitlement about being exonerated after, say, shooting an unarmed person or refusing to run into a school to save children. I am not the only person to have their brain broken by law enforcement, and many of the people to whom that happened are still cops. That hypervigilance, those obsessive thoughts about danger around every corner, that's part of law enforcement culture. It's part of the training. It's part of the mentoring. It's woven into the DNA of how cops operate every day. That's why there's this almost unbridgeable gulf between a normal person who says something like, why did you punch that guy 37 times just for having his hands in his pockets? And the cop who replies, because I didn't know what was in there. It could have been a knife or a gun or a jar of battery acid that he was going to throw in my face. I didn't want to take the chance. I guarantee you that cop was at a seminar one time where some old head was telling a war story about his partner, Bob Sacamano, who actually did get battery acid thrown in his face. There are approximately 900,000 police officers in the United States. And I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of them were trained like I was and have the same mental pathways that I have. That's a lot of unarmed, unaccountable people running around fantasizing about being executed in the streets every day. And yeah, this may inspire some sympathy in you for those cops. I don't think it's a coincidence that cops endure this kind of abusive working mode and then turn to alcohol abuse and even more notoriously, child abuse and intimate partner abuse. Yes, many people who are already abusive enter law enforcement because the profession protects abusers, 
But I do think that the job can, over time, make people much more abusive than they were when they started, both through the training and through the peer pressure. Counseling and therapy are totally stigmatized in law enforcement. If your department finds out that you're receiving mental health treatment, you risk missing out on special assignments and promotions for being unstable. So everyone... Isn't that wild? Isn't that fucking wild? Again, that's documented, by the way. When fighting these demons is fighting alone. But I'm not arguing for sympathy, and I'm not asking you to empathize with anyone. Instead, all of the- One quick second. I want to tell another anecdote from my time covering the protests back in 2020. Um, back in 2020, there was a video that we watched on this very stream, back when I was on Twitch, and it was a video uh, from Minneapolis, where, as you all know, the George Floyd protests were very, very, very strong. It was a video in which a police officer, uh, there was a line of cops standing outside of a building and one of the police officers had engaged in dialogue with two unarmed protesters. And these protesters were two young uh, women and they came up to the police officer and they were basically begging and crying uh, these po this police officer to understand their predicament. And, uh, they were pleading with this police officer and the police officer started to cry. You could literally see in the video that there were tears running down this police officer's face because the two young women were talking about their family member who had been killed by the police recently. And uh, the cop next to the crying police officer nudges the, the uh, sergeant who's standing behind. You can see he's got a different uniform and everything. They nudge him, and then the sergeant comes over, grabs the police officer with the tears running down their face, pulls them inside, and puts another cop in their place. It's that It goes that far. That even when dealing with unarmed protesters, the, even showing the emotion gets you pulled off the line and replaced by somebody else who isn't em empathetic who isn't affected by it. This is what people mean, by the way, when they say ACAB. It's that the institution s makes you a bastard by, by, it, by design. It turns every single person who puts that badge on into a, into a bastard. And if you are not a bastard, then they get you out of the police force, which means the only remaining cops are fucking bastards. This is yet another reason why I am a police abolitionist and why I believe that the profession, as it exists today, cannot be reformed into something better and must instead be replaced. The hundreds of thousands of cops with these hypervigilant, alarmist thought patterns are not going to be receptive to being disarmed and trained not to kill. Hell, when I was a cop, even in my later nice cop years, I wouldn't have been receptive to being part of an unarmed community service role. I would have balked at any training that said that police should err on the side of not killing someone during a tense, uncertain, rapidly evolving situation. I would have told you that it was dangerous to dissuade cops from killing because it means that they will hesitate when that day comes. Any training or policy that put civilian lives ahead of police officer lives would have been killed off by a massive mobilization of angry officers. Among the 900,000 cops out there, are there caring, compassionate officers who just want their community to be safe? Sure. Would some of them make amazing community care responders and conflict mediators and mental health crisis counselors? Absolutely. But these officers are not driving department policy, they're certainly not driving federal policy, and they are not leading the culture of modern American law enforcement. They exist, but they are not representative of the whole of policing. And when you call 911, there's a low likelihood that you're going to get officer friendly instead of Sergeant Dick Rifle. From the frequent police murders of unarmed civilians to the now frequent refusal of police to defend school children, it's painfully obvious that the American officer safety mindset is a clear and present threat to everyone in this country. Anytime you're within 20 feet of a cop, you are in danger, both from their overactive imagination and from their total systemic insulation from consequences. You should never feel safe when the cops arrive, unless- 
every single cop, every single cop in America, I am the danger! You're rich and white. Anyway, a weirdly personal one tonight. What do you think? I'm sure those of you with CPTSD can probably relate to the racing thoughts and hypervigilance. What techniques work for you? Also, how do you like these little low-key, kind of sloppy vlogs as opposed to my more researched, more complex topics? Let us know in the comments.